support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89. And hello again, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us. The suspense, uh, there wasn't much, not in Arkansas, not in this cycle. Nonetheless, a bit of history made, our state elected and handily its first woman governor and the first in American history to succeed her father, at least in the same state. Sarah Huckabee Sanders was the odds-on favorite from the moment she announced her candidacy, so much so that she forced out of the Republican primary two other candidates one of whom early next year will become the state's first female lieutenant governor and the other, of course, attorney general. So come January, what? A couple of familiar faces join us now. Jay Barth, emeritus professor of political science at Hendricks College, a longtime Democratic activist, and Richard Bearden, political consultant, former executive director of the Republican Party of Arkansas. Gentlemen, thanks for coming in. Uh, whoever wants to pick it up first. Obviously, Ms. Sanders had a very good night. There was a lot of spec that she would underperform. And in fact, she did compared to the others on the ticket. The, uh, of course, the other rivals, anyway, didn't have any money. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the question going into to, uh, Tuesday was not so much who was going to win this race. It was always clear that, that Sarah Huckabee Sanders was going to win. But, but what would the gap be? And, yeah. and, and obviously there had been some polling uh, that indicated that it was a closer race and that, that uh, Chris Jones had his, his kind of grassroots campaign had really kind of gotten some momentum uh, and he was maybe going to uh, approach 50, excuse me, 40 percent or maybe even a little bit better. And that was really the question. He didn't get anywhere near right. uh, near that. And it really shows the, the challenges facing the Democratic Party in the state for the for yep. the near future. Richard Bearden. Yeah, I agree. I, there was some polling that maybe showed it a little bit closer. I think the Arkansas poll showed that gap had kind of widened out. But, you know, she won handily, 28-point gap. Uh, I think there were a lot of folks that said, gosh, there's yard signs here. There's, uh, you know, somebody anecdotally said in the coffee shop, my friend's a Republican, he's voting. That just didn't materialize. So uh, Chris Jones, it all appeared fine candidate. I think he, he won Pulaski, Jefferson, one or two Delta counties, and surprisingly, he did very well in Washington County. But outside of that, it was a, it was a red tide from uh, the governor's race all the way down the ballot. And in fact, and we can talk about this a little bit later on, it drug Republicans to win some historically Democrat seats in the legislature. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the Democratic challenge in the Delta was a particular particularly telling. I mean, those are counties that up and down the, 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 the Delta counties that, that are on the Mississippi River, Democrats tend to win those counties, even yeah. in presidential races, et cetera. Uh, they barely won them if they won them. In yeah. many cases, they <clears throat> lost those counties. Really just shows the, the, the fact that while Jones did, I think, have some good momentum in some more urban areas, he just did not have a kind of a statewide uh, campaign to even win places he should have won. The one race that, that drew my eye was the one in Crittenden County where Senator Ingram uh, declined to seek a, another term and a well-known, <laughs> well-regarded uh, Mr. Murdoch uh, representative won the Democratic nomination uh, but did not win by anything near the margins that Mr. Ingram routinely racked up. But so and, and I, you, see, I, you just, see that Democratic weakening in the Delta. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Five, there was a 500 vote margin uh, that uh, Representative Murdoch uh, won by, and at the same time he won the Senate seat, a Republican wins his old House seat. Right. The House seat did uh, reconfigure down there. But, you know, to Jay's point, up and down the Mississippi River, traditional strongholds, Pulaski, Jefferson, and these Delta regional counties, traditional strongholds of the, of the party, if you're a Democrat. And Monty Hodges, who gives his seat up to run for Congress, picked up by a Republican, high minority population. I mentioned Re Reggie Murdoch, uh, David Fielding in South Arkansas, right. high minority population loses. So Republicans end up on election night picking up four seats that were drawn for heavy minority population districts, including the seat up in, it was Megan Godfrey's OC, high uh, Latino population, w with one seat with a four vote margin here in Conway. <laughs> so, you know, there's still votes to be counted there. Republicans could have had, end up having, if they pick up all five seats, an overwhelming night, again, drawing deep into seats that have always been on the D side. Mm -hmm. 
What, Jay? Well, and, uh, Richard said, you know, it was a red tide in Arkansas, and, and I think it was, and it, once again, Arkansas kind of operates in an orbit <laughs> of its own, because it was clearly not a red tide nationally. Right. It was, it, right. it was a, a very mixed story, and Democrats overperformed, I think, uh, compared yeah. to uh, expectations. But in Arkansas, we did our own thing, uh, and uh, once again, and, and I think that's what makes Arkansas politics interesting, and uh, no matter uh, the outcome. I did think it was very telling that on the, for all the, the, the statewide races, there really wasn't a whole lot of gap. Um, there was a little, obviously, uh, Chris Jones did a little bit better, um, uh, and uh, in the state treasurer's race, there was a little bit of a slide over performance yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, but even there, I mean, we had a pretty flawed Republican candidate. I think everybody, many people would agree. Endor, uh, sh the Democrat was endorsed by the statewide newspaper, and she didn't really get much traction out of that. And the way in which it's now all about party rather than personality, uh, which is a real game change from the, the, nine, the 80s, the 90s, yeah. the early, um, early parts of this century, that's a real uh, different kind of Arkansas politics. Let's go to January, if we can. Uh, she, Ms. Sanders, all right, she was guaranteed a, a veto-proof majority in, in her party anyway. It's even, as Richard pointed out, it's even going to be larger. And frankly, the state treasury right now is stinking rich, unless the economy just really tanks. So what, uh, how is Ms. Sanders going to govern? She, she uh, you know, her dad always ran to the right and then moved to the center as a pragmatist when he governed. Will the party want to take Ms. Sanders? Will there be pressure on her to go farther than she really wants to go? You know, I think because she has such Both a... Both in substantive legislation and in fiscal legislation. Yeah. I think because she has such a strong mandate and really a really great relationship with the speaker and the incoming president uh, pro tem, Bart Hester, I think she's going to have a really smooth sailing session the first go round. Who knows uh, what happens as you go down the, the pile. But remember, there's 31 or 32 new House members coming in. Uh, there's, there's 13 new senators, I believe, coming in. So there's going to be uh, a lot of members coming in. They're going to be on the same learning curve, if you will, as she is. They're going to look to their leadership in the House and the Senate. And again, with those strong relationships, I think she'll get a lot of information, a lot of the stuff that she wants out to members and be able to get the things bills passed, initiatives she wants passed with pretty strong margins. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we don't know a lot about what that agenda is going to be. I mean, she did not provide a yeah. lot of detail during this campaign, uh, and I think she was criticized for that. Um, and so we don't yet know. I mean, I think that agenda is being built out. I know she, she clearly knows what she wants to get yeah. done, uh, even <laughs> though it wasn't articulated during the campaign. I do think a, a big question early on with that, with that surplus is, um, you know, how much is dedicated to tax cuts, of course. Um, and then how much is dedicated to some of the, the programs that have gotten a lot of attention, such as teacher pay, um, where I think there was a, there was a lot of pressure built um, on uh, raising teacher pay to, yeah. to a more regional uh, um, level. And uh, that's going to be a big question because that's a big dollar, um, dollar amount. Um, but, but I will say this, you know, and I've been to a lot of events uh, that Sarah was at, and she said uh, education initiatives, uh, workforce training, and job creation. And I think she really sees those coupled. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, the, the scores came out. Uh, Arkansas during the pandemic took a dip in a bunch of the scoring uh, categories. So I think you're going to see a lot of time and energy put into early reading initiatives. And, you know, all that really ties together. If you've got an educated workforce, you can then go out and recruit better paying jobs. And we're seeing that, you know, in places like Mississippi County which I think has become the Benton County of Northeast Arkansas when you've got steel mills, you've got uh, electronic vehicle companies coming in. So there are some bright spots. I think she clearly sees we've got to have that educated workforce that's got to be uh, a, a big piece of the job creation. And then, as she said in the campaign, cutting taxes is a pay raise. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think she's got some initiatives. If you mentioned, Steve, she's going to have the money to do it. The well, as, as we're thinking back to our father, the way in which he governed, he clearly was very much populist on, yeah. on most yeah. bread and butter issues. But he did always have, you know, uh, social issues that he emphasized as oftentimes that were more symbolic. I think hers are going to be more expansive, uh, partly yeah. pressured by the legislature to do more on, on social issues. Um, and I think that they are... She, they aren't just symbolic for her. I think she is more of a true believer on some of those uh, social issues. That's going to be also very interesting. Yeah. To what degree does she, does that become the show rather than the, the bread and butter issues, which I think, as Richard just said, 
uh, are really what she talked about on the campaign for the most part. Yeah, uh, Jay, the other constitutional offices, Jay mentioned the uh, the treasurer's office, of course, but there were really no surprises on any others. Ms. Rutledge handily won. All of the constitutional Republican constitutional candidates just you know sailed right in. Just a lack of a lack of money. For one so, thing, and, and of course, ideology factors into it. As uh, that's well. right, and I, it is a lack of money. But I also do think, and we saw this. I mean, 10, 12 years ago, uh, when when the when the Democrats started losing those rural districts, you know, that had traditionally been for a hundred years, and suddenly now Republicans are winning state Senate seats and state House seats in the not just the mountain counties in Northwest Arkansas, which, as Jay knows, have always been traditionally Republican since the Civil War. But, but that started to move into the North Central and then sort of Northeast. Uh, when I was ED of the state party... And East and South. <laughs> and, and, and now completely down yeah. the Delta and, and into South Arkansas. You know, when I was ED of the state Republican party, we had six Republican senators. There are now six members of the Democratic party that are that are in the state Senate. Mm -hmm. And again, won by a much closer margin than expected. I think that's probably the parity you're going to see. I think in the House you're going to see it maybe tick up one or two seats moving forward. But, uh, and again, I've been in the wilderness with the Republican Party when we were scrapping $2 together for an event. The Democratic Party has a long way to go to rebuild. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only sign of, of any kind of hope for the Democratic Party out of this race was the win in Washington County. It was a close win for yep. Chris Jones. But that does begin to finally show a little bit of momentum in Northwest Arkansas. we got a long way to go. But I think if, if the Democrats are going to come back, we've said it for now probably a, t a decade, it's got to happen. It's got to happen in Northwest Arkansas, yeah. and they got a little traction, but it, they don't have the resources right now to make the kind of investments to make it. You know, and make a decade may be the key word yeah. there because we're we, we're going to live with these districts. That, well, both parties yeah. have to live with sure. these districts, you know, for the next ten years. Yeah. And I was I was struck by a quote in this morning's Democrat or, or in the Democrat. Yeah, I think it was Thursday morning's Democrat Gazette from Mr. Pilkington, Pilkington, who represented Pilkington, mm -hmm. who helped coordinate the campaigns. Yeah. Uh, the Democratic Party is viewed as Pulaski County and Fayetteville. And you look at the numbers and that's pretty close. It, it is, but the interesting part about because I went and looked at the Washington County numbers, Jones wins a couple of thousand votes, three, four thousand votes maybe. The entire rest of the Republican slate wins and every elected official at the courthouse level is, is Republican. It was before, but they retained it. So again, he clearly had an appeal, younger voters or whatever, I think uh, the uh, marijuana initiative won up there fairly handily. So you may have had young voters that went and picked two races and didn't vote anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But again, I think you're right, Jay, I agree. If there is growth to be had in the, in the Democrat Party, Democratic Party, it's probably going to be in Northwest Arkansas with the infusion of new people in. Both parties are going to have to get very competitive up there and not only the candidates, but their infrastructure and their turnout mechanisms and everything because I think that's going to be Little Rock, Jefferson County, Two anchors. What happens in Northwest Arkansas could control, you know, to some degree, the parity in the legislature in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Take a look at the issues, the ballot issues, if we can, because at this taping anyway, all of them went down. Mm -hmm. it, there may be some still a few votes here and there on the religious freedom thing, but number one, uh, number one, which would allow the legislature to call itself into session. Boom, uh, boom, and uh, you know, polling on that had looked pretty close. It just got demolished. Um, I mean. Arkansans are, are, not, are, not in a, are not in a big government. I think there was, you know, a little grassroots opposition. This is the one that I thought actually had the best chance of winning uh, of the of the four going in, but it got it got demolished. And uh, Richard, what about yeah. say? I agree. I, I don't. I, I think there were a lot of people that went in there. They knew, and I really think it was in the closing week or two where they really focused on recreational marijuana. And uh, obviously that opposition grew, and then it just became a snowball. I'm against all this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what any of this stuff is, and so I'm gonna be against all of it. Mm -hmm. So again, no surprise, mm -hmm. but uh, 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 that it failed as big as it did. Number two. Number two is the, the would have changed the percentage Perce of votes needed to amendments. pass uh, yeah. amendments and initiatives, um, and it, it also got demolished. There was a pretty strong campaign against this one, yeah. um, really mostly from, from the left, but some also, I mean, the, the right has used uh, the ballot measure uh, pretty successfully over the years, um, so voters want to keep their control. This is obviously very important 
when we get to issue four in terms of the future of medical mar of, of recreational marijuana because now it does have a chance to come back uh, down the line and I think there's some books built. They're already planning it. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. And, and the really the only surprise there is if you if you were opposed to recreational marijuana, you probably should have voted four two to make it harder <laughs> to get back on the ballot. So again, but, I think it I, goes back to people were. They, they just got up there and it was, I don't know, I'm against all this no, stuff. No, right? no, yeah. no, 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 no. I do yeah. think uh, yeah. a lot of no, opposition. Take number three, which we'll, is religious we'll there freedom. There, yeah, there may right. be some maneuvering room there anyway, or in terms of some loose votes, not loose votes, but I mean a, a recount. And that was the religious freedom proposal, number three, which seemed to have some appeal and it got closer than any of the other three. Again, my take on that is the, 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 the church folks, the evangelicals that came out to vote against recreational marijuana probably looked at that and thought it's a good thing. Obviously not enough votes to get there, but again, I just don't think people knew really what it did and when in doubt, vote no, and that's what happened. Yeah, it had a very appealing top-level ballot <laughs> title, but you got below that and it got very confusing, very yeah. legalese, uh, um, very quickly, and I think it, it was... It, it just lots of confusion. Yeah. And uh, another on word measure. on marijuana now because that was number four and that got expensive. Yeah, and, and the opposition on this really did come from the right and from the left. I mean, very traditional yeah. opposition to uh, marijuana as a gateway drug, the same opponents that fought uh, medical marijuana. But there was opposition from the left as well. Folks are really concerned about monopolization of, uh, that was laid out in this to really give the current medical uh, license uh, both dispensaries and uh, and cultivators a lot of power, and that was really troublesome to a lot of folks who, that who had some economic, Yeah, that Im economic imperial imperialistic uh, yep. argument I heard a lot when I talked to voters about it who really weren't one way or the other on on marijuana per se. They didn't like the uh, the monopolization. I, I, look, yeah. I look at all four of these, and you know, Arkansas on the issues still is a pretty populous state. These are all. Yep you know, kind of populist activities, um, but our, our positions, but at the, at the statewide level and the partisan level, it's very Republican state. So it's a, there is some confusion when you take the partisan label away where our Kansans really are on yeah. some of these and, issues. And you know, I would say this, that last push on the, the recreational marijuana, I mean, it was, it was a good ad, but, but it really, I think, laid out to voters that were opposed to it how much they needed to be out and get against it. Because it was, the premise was, it'll be just like buying a six pack. And I think people started to then think, well, there's going to be dispensaries all over my neighborhood, just like a, a, a package store. Uh, because, again, the, the fact that it flipped so heavy upside down mm -hmm. with such a huge amount of money raised, $13 million, I think is what the last report was, $13 million raised, I guess about a million and a half, $2 million against it. You would have thought they had all the tools to get there. But, again, I think Arkansas maybe just went, not now, maybe not ever. Maybe they come back. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. We ought to mention our U.S. Senators, less Mr. Bozeman, who had won his, his third term in the Senate uh, quite easily. Uh, it was the other senator who made maybe a bit more news by saying what he isn't going to run for in two years, and of course that's Mr. Cotton. Richard? You know, crowded field. Tom, uh, Senator Cotton has two young small children. Uh, you know, I, we talked a little bit earlier about the red wave that so didn't does take Mr. place. DeSantis. He has three small That's, <laughs> that's true. Uh, and, and maybe uh, Governor DeSantis has a bug right now that Senator Cotton just doesn't have. Who knows? But he's made his decision early. I think uh, we'll see what comes down the line on that presidential race. You know, President Biden the other day says, oh, a decision will soon be made, but I'm running. Uh, but we'll make a decision. Uh, you've got uh, former President Trump, who I think had a terrible night in the midterms, a horrible night. Uh, you know, Republicans are kind of saying it's time to move on. So, I, you know, there'll be a field out there. The question is, where does it start to narrow down on both sides? I think if, if in the end President Biden ends up not running, it probably hurts some Democrat chances. I think on the Republican side, they hope Mr. Trump will make that decision not to run. And then I think there'll be a bigger gate, including, you know, our own governor potentially who's thinking about what to do. Uh, so, I, again, I don't know the midterms gave us a very clear picture about what 2024 looks like. Well, the, I, my sense too was that Mr. May, May, Mr. Cotton may have calculated that the next Republican presidential primary season will be exceptionally bloody, particularly if Mr. Trump gets back in there and no matter who emerges from it will be really bloody when the, when the, yeah. Yeah. And with, I think the we, with the convention. And, you know, Citra Cotton's still a young guy. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and he's got, there are lots, lots of election cycles to come. And he may be better positioned in the future than at this particular moment 
uh, where the, the stars are probably not going to align. And it's, it, you don't want to be a loser early in your career. But well, you carry that the rest of your career. Uh, uh, Richard mentioned Mr. Hutchinson, who's made plain. You know, he's sniffing about the race. So wh what's his path? For Richard, does he have a path forward? Well, does what happened on Tuesday maybe clear the air, or maybe create a bit of a lane for him? Could I, you know? I think with, with all of these uh, candidates who who want to get out there, it, it's, it's got to be you got to have a money money, you got to have the financial backing, and then you've got to have a message. And I think uh, Governor Hutchinson is, is in that stage of you know, is the money out there? Is the message resonating? Again, as a Republican, you can look see what happened. We clearly recruited Trump-backed candidates that were not very good. You can look at Pennsylvania. And you can look at a couple of other states where the, the Republican candidates just got shellacked, and they were very openly Trump-backed uh, and, and Trump accolades. So for me, I think that does create a little bit of a narrow window. Uh, but again, the governor's going to have to raise money, and he's going to have to get out there and go to a bunch of states early, and he's going to have to connect uh, with a lot of policymakers and decision makers and big money people in a very short amount of time. Yeah, Jay. Yeah, and, and I, I think there's a big a question: how much he likes that game, you know? Yeah. Um, does he really have the appetite? Does he fall in it. love with it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, he's never done that before. Um, and and he, he may he, he, it may connect for him, or, or he may yeah. just say, you know, <laughs> this is a lot of work. I can go home and 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 have a, a really nice, chill, yeah, pleasant life. <laughs> Go Governor Beebe, you don't hear much from him no, these days. No, uh, no. He plays a lot of golf, yeah, so he, yeah. might, he might be happy. The mayoral uh, election in Little Rock. I mean, the whole state was watching. It's ca Arkansas's capital city after yep. a while. Yep. Um, so Mayor Frank Scott um, won. Again, about, a case of <laughs> yeah. expectations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, won by about 10 points over Steve Landers. I think folks thought it was going to be a much tighter race. Um, in fact, I think folks didn't exactly know where that race was going to go. No. Um, no. You know, the the. the and obviously, I, I was part of that administration for a couple of years. Um, the I think the sad thing out of that race is how divided the state's capital city is. Um, it is uh, he, uh, Mayor Scott ran on a, a unifying uh, theme four years ago. I think there was a lot of enthusiasm for him, and really enthusiasm for his opponents as well. Uh, now this was a race that was much more voting against. A, someone rather than voting for someone. And uh, Steve Landers was someone who, who became, I think, very, very scary for uh, a lot of progressives in the city. And um, I think the attacks on, on Mayor Scott in the closing weeks uh, around transparency and FOIA and things like that really brought black voters, um, his base out in strong numbers because it was an attack not on someone who's symbolically very important in that community. So um, very divided, um, and, and, and Scott won on the basis of votes south of 630 and then some white progressive uh, precincts just kind of north of 630. That's what put him over the edge. But West Little Rock and Northwest Ar Little Rock emphatically opposed. Just a sharp divided sharp. line. He yeah, run sharp yeah and you know, I think uh, the, the thing that sort of struck me in this race, it, it really did kind of become a personality race. Uh, you know, and Frank's a likable guy. I think the, the, the Steve Landers that ran versus the Steve Landers that used to make funny car commercials it was a stiff guy versus a guy that was kind of likable. And I think, look, kudos to Frank Scott. He overcame a lot, a lot. I don't think many people fully understand the FOIA, but people knew something's going on here that probably doesn't look very right. He overcame all of that and won resounding. To your point, Steve, the city is, is not just divided, you know, maybe black, white, but it is clearly divided geographically where those communities live. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think the mayor has got to, uh, you know, is there a moment here for the Bill Clinton? I heard you. I understand. I'm going to make some adjustments and I am going to be mayor for everybody moving forward. I think there's sort of an opportunity for him. I will say this. He picked up another supporter on the city board. Yes, uh, so that will help a little bit. I, you know, we probably went from two solid votes to three, but you know, like a, the governor in the legislature, he, he's got a hostile city board, if you will, yeah. that he's got to work all of his initiatives through. It didn't seem to matter that the sales tax and other things lost. Again, a big win for the, for the mayor, but there's a lot to be done in Little Rock, the crime situation and so many other things that have got to be addressed. Yeah, he's, he's got, uh, Mayor Scott has to show he can listen 
um, in a legitimate way. I mean, I think there was a lot of critique of him. John Brumman had a great column midway through the campaign you know, that, that he, he has conversations with everybody, but does he really act on those? Uh, yeah. those conversations and, and really hear people that he needs to make some changes. I think this is next few weeks are going to be a real test for him. What kind of administration he's going to have and as a result, what kind of city Little Rock's going to be because it's a really important thing for uh, for a place that I love a lot, but also oh, yeah. a place that is so important to the, you see the state this, of Arkansas. Yeah, you see this so often in politics at every level. A, 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 an incumbent sticks with a circle of trusted aides, even with even when it does not appear to be working. Are very well. Some changes need to be made. I think the Bill Clinton 1982-83 yeah. is the model that, that needs to be acquired here. Got to cut it off there because we're out of time. Guys, thanks as always for coming in. And as always, we thank you for watching. See you next week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89.